Hello, it's good morning uh, for us, uh, for those of you watching at home. Uh, this may not be uh, morning, this could be just about any time. Um, I'm Mark Chapman, editor of Nancy on Norwalk and moderator of the debate. Nancy Chapman will be the timer. Uh, we ask everyone who is here, and we do have a small audience in the house, to remain quiet. No applause, cheering, jeering, or tearing. We ask everyone to turn off your cell phones and any other electronic devices other than pacemakers that might be a distraction. Uh, this is a Nancy on Norwalk run debate, our first. It features the two District A Board of Education candidates, uh, Dr. Evel Krevker, uh, running on the Democratic line, uh, sitting on your left, and on your right, Mr. Joseph Perella, running as an unaffiliated candidate on the Republican line. Each candidate will be given two minutes for an opening statement, and then we will ask a series of questions alternating who gets to go first. Each candidate will get a one-minute rebuttal for each question, and the moderator reserves the right to ask for more specific answers. At the end of the questions, each candidate will get a two-minute closing statement. And we tossed a coin to see who will open, and uh, Dr. Kroker is uh, the uh, person who is going to open up with the first statement. So uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, well, hello to everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to be here, to have the opportunity to uh, allow myself to get to know um, everyone in the room, as well as those who are viewing this uh, online. <clears throat> I first want to thank Mr. Perilla for making himself available. It's been very difficult for me to be able to uh, uh, attend some of the forums, and I'm very pleased that Nancy Onalwak is uh, doing this for the voters and, and also giving me the opportunity to uh, express myself or to share some of my ideas. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Perilla. Uh, yeah, just good morning to everyone, and again, thank you for, for putting this together. Again, I know that there was kind of some scheduling issues and really wanted to, uh, to, to really get this together so that voters would have the opportunity to hear uh, really, you know, where, where we stand and, and what we are intending to do, you know, if we are elected to the board. So thank you. Okay, uh, first question to Mr. Perilla. Uh, given the recent history and the uh, golden handcuffs clause in Dr. Uh, Adamowski's contract, there is a good chance the uh, Board of Education members elected in November will be involved in the next superintendent search and hiring. Uh, one can hope that that won't be the case, but it's very probable. So this is a two-parter. Would you vote to use the same search firm, PROACT, or any of its offshoots or successors, given the controversy surrounding them? And would you vote to keep the search secret until a decision has been made, as has been done recently, as opposed to bringing in, uh, making the last couple of finalists uh, public? Um, Mr. Perella. Um, I mean, it's hard to say until, you know, let's say the, the, the moment actually comes, if you would use the same search firm. But I would say that, um, you know, given what they've done so far, um, that there would be no reason not to, or at least examine other, you know, um, companies or agencies out there that are doing, doing the same thing. Um, in terms of opening it to the public, I think that at some point you may, but I also think that it is important that it is kind of done in an executive session, um, because I think that potentially you could be clouding your decision based on input from the public who may or may not have all of the information in front of them. Okay. Doctor? Um, for me, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of the search firm, um, I would always like to revisit um, our options um, and just to see which search firm meets our particular needs, whether it's the one that was previously used or a new search firm. So that being said, in terms of how, it, uh, how we will go about um, identifying a superintendent, I do agree with the, the fact that we need to uh, keep it uh, within the board because what you tend to do there is you might have a high quality candidate who doesn't want to apply because they're currently under contract. Um, unless <clears throat> we change how we uh, do things as a state and say, you know, everything's gonna be open or everything's gonna be closed, uh, 
I totally agree with keeping things uh, secret, as you might want to say, until we get to the uh, finalist stage where the candidate or candidates feel more comfortable and the board might open it up to the public. Uh, that being said, in terms of trying to find the best candidate, I also believe that we should try and have it as open as possible. So I know I'm talking, you know, you know, doing like apples and oranges here, but uh, I think in, uh, interaction between the audience, which is with the parents, the voters, and the candidates is very, very important. But if we don't make it uh, under executive um, meetings, then there's less likely that we'll be able to find the best candidate for the position. Okay. Uh, Mr. Perella, any response to that? Or No, I mean, I, I, again, I agree. I think that it is important that, you know, you, you, the board is really looking at this from an executive level simply because of the confidentiality of some of these, you know, potential candidates. Um, you know, they may not be open to applying if they know the public is going to be, you know, watching and potential their, their, their current employer. So I think that's that's kind of important. Uh, Dr. Krebker, do you have anything to add? Oh, no. Okay. We'll move on to the next question. And this one, uh, uh, Dr. Krebker, is yours to start. Uh, what is your position on charter schools and other public-private partnerships in the school system and uh, also on school vouchers? Uh, well, I'm a public school product. Um, my personal preference and professional preference is to keep everything in-house and have uh, the school district run its own schools. I can see the value of some charter schools because they tend to specialize, but there's no reason why we couldn't also specialize within the public school system. Um, <clears throat> so my stance on it is that um, if we ever do any sort of partnership or even th consider doing anything outside of Norwalk Public Schools, that we don't take anything away from Norwalk Public Schools, that it only enhances and improves what we do. Okay, Mr. Perella. Um, to, to some extent, I, I agree. Uh, you know, I, I believe that we, we shouldn't really be, uh, you know, if you're looking at charter schools, you shouldn't be looking at a charter school at the expense of something from the public school. Um, but I do believe that, you know, if, if the community, if the parents, if the public within Norwalk, within the district, if it's something that they're interested in, then it should be something that is explored. Um, again, it, it should not be at the expense of anything that's currently done. But I think that also, you know, the, the, the charter schools send, tend to um, currently have, you know, are doing more outside of, let's say, the normal uh, general public education. So there may be learnings and there may be expertise that you're able to uh, somehow use or bring in. Okay. Uh, Dr. Krebker, uh, any response? No, I don't have any. And Ms. Perella. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Moving to the third question. There's a finite pot of money um, <clears throat> once the budget is established, and it is a huge portion of the uh, city of Norwalk's budget. Um, and there's an infinite number of things to spend that money on. Uh, special education, of course, extracurriculars, technology, staffing, professional development, and lots more. Um, and, uh, Ms. Perella, what would be your spending priorities? In terms of? In terms <clears throat> of the Board of Education budget. What, where do you think the, the resources need to be, need to go, and where, where might they be uh, trimmed or, or taken from if you need to? Uh, well, well, I would say that the, the, the first thing that you really need to do is, is look at the way you're spending. And currently, I think that, you know, the, the processes and the procedures that we're using through, you know, let's say our central office uh, could definitely be modernized and streamlined um, to, to gain efficiencies. So potentially, while you're maybe not, um, you know, cutting funding, you're, you're stretching your dollars to, to get more from them. Um, I think, you know, right now, the, the, the biggest allocation of the budget is your teachers. And I think that you, you can't really start to, you know, trim down, you know, the, your, your educators. Uh, you know, you need to be competitive with the surrounding towns. And, um, you know, when you start to, um, let's say, not be competitive, you, you tend to lose teachers and administrators. So I think it's important that, you know, you, you spend the money where you need to, but you also really look to spend it wisely. Um, so 
one of the biggest things that, that I would look to do is, is you know, what, what I would refer to as, you know, operational excellence, which is really looking at the way you operate and the way that, you know, the processes and procedures by which you get things done. I think that right now um, there's, there needs, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in that area. Okay, Dr. Crocker. <clears throat> For me, uh, in terms of priority, the first would be uh, performance. And not the way that we tend to look at performance in terms of just academic performance, but also social, social development, uh, making sure that students have what they need in order to, in order to socially in, develop and grow, as, grow up as individuals. Um, that being said, if we focus on their development, that translates or should translate into positive outcomes in terms of academic performance. In order to truly uh, sustain this, uh, we need to um, provide professional development that um, supports the policies and programs that we have in place uh, and that we want to develop over time to make it sustainable. And the way to make it sustainable is by building capacity. Um, if we build capacity with our administrators and our teachers and allow them to get training that is specialized where they self-select what they want to learn, but at the same time train them in terms of here's the direction that we're going in and we're going to train you in these areas, then it's more likely that we maintain, keep these uh, administrators and the teachers that we do have become teacher leaders and eventually they might become the administrators that take over for the, those who might retire. Because what I don't want to happen is I don't want to have um, high turnover for administrators and high turnover for teachers. Because if we're continually training teachers and, and trying to uh, help them stay in uh, North Public Schools, then we'll never be able to uh, advance in terms of a high academic achievement. Okay. Uh, Mr. Perella, do you have anything to add? Or uh, well, I, again, I, I I agree with the with professional de development. I think that's critical with you know moving forward and again retaining teachers. I think it's also important that you look at professional development, you know, as it pertains to again building capacity. So early literacy is is you know an area where you know it, it's it's proven that that's where it all starts. So having teachers that are really um, you know trained and focused on the capabilities within that area. Is, is critical. So if teachers don't have that capability, potentially giving them the professional development they need um, is, is critical. Okay, do you have anything to add? Uh, I just wanna extend what I was saying about the sure. professional development. Um, the, what I want to see it yield is um, reduced costs down the road. For example, if we build the capacity and we provide professional development and we know that our teachers and administrators have X, Y, and Z, meaning that they know about instruction, they know about assessment, they know how to provide uh, supports and services <clears throat> and interventions for students. Then down the road, it's less likely that we'll need to uh, outplace students or it's less, less likely that we'll need to uh, uh, hire someone to come into the school district and provide consult, uh, consultation and supports because we'll have that capacity and we'll have that type of uh, um, personnel and talent within the district. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think, uh, who's, who's first here? I, I've lost track. So have I. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I, think, I, think, I think I think I just answered the last one first. Okay. 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 I'm sorry. I <clears throat> kind of knew with this. Okay, uh, Dr. Kravka. Um, what about the biggest priority specifically in District A? This is, of course, a district, not a, not a uh, at-large election. And uh, District A has had... Uh, some issues here and there. Uh, where, what do you see are the, are the focused district priorities? Um, for me, it's, um, it's class size and making sure that within, this, within the district, as well as, this, as well, uh, within District A, as well as the district, but that we have, say for example, at Jefferson, that we have equitable uh, distribution of students across classrooms. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I like to re somehow reduce uh, class size, have the opportunity to not have portables. Um, to me, portables are uh, something that's uh, supposed to be a Band-Aid, not a long-term uh, type of uh, solution. Um, so for, for the priority for me is to try and figure out what can we do now to reduce the class sizes and improve instruction in the classrooms. And in that sense, it's related to learning conditions and working conditions, because we can't just say, <clears throat> excuse me, it's about the students, it's also about the adults who work with the students. So we have to make sure that the working conditions are there for them in order to work well with the students. Um, I think we need to work on the now 
but at the same time plan for the future so that we no longer need portables in terms of the infrastructure. We need to build, extend the buildings, but I understand it's also related to budgets and, and issues that um, might restrain us from ideally planning what is needed for now and what we need to do for now. But we need to consider it and plan for it so this doesn't happen to us again in the future. And if it does, then it's only a temporary fix and not a long-term fix. Mr. Perella. Um, again, Jefferson is definitely the, let's say, the, the, the biggest, if you want to call it, issue right now. I mean, I, I think it's obvious that it's overpopulated. Um, you know, I know that there is plans within the next year's budget for, um, you know, reviewing a design for renovations and then potentially money in the budget or projected budget for the year after to actually do some of those renovations. Um, I'm not really convinced that that is going to be the answer. Um, I think that we are at a, at a critical point where the facility study that's going on right now is really going to tell us, you know, what is going on with, with the neighborhood schools, with different locations, with kids coming from um, other districts. You know, one thing that um, is, is really compelling about Jefferson is that even with the overcrowding, um, it's a school that was recognized for Blue Ribbon a year ago for closing the achievement gap. So there's things there that even with the challenges they're presented with, um, teachers and administrators are, are clearly getting it done. So even from a, a, you know, the entire school board, uh, you know, what are they doing that can be done in other schools? Um, another thing that I've been kind of hearing as I've talked to people among the district is people are concerned that, that are going to Tracy, parents from Tracy, because with the, all the development going on, those kids aren't going to Jefferson, they're going to Tracy. So the, the increase in development in town is starting to drive up and raise concerns in other schools. So it really is looking at this facility studies to see what is the best way to utilize our facilities and potentially um, you know, redistrict if, if needed. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kravger, do you have any, uh, anything to add or uh, any yeah. response? Yeah. Um, what I like to say is that in, when I've been door knocking and talking to some of the voters and some of the parents, uh, their main concern is that this, has, this overcrowding has been going on for too long. Um, so waiting for the facility study to come about and to tell us what we need to do and, and having um, renovations or um, in the budget or projected to be in the budget, it, it takes too long. By the time that happens, uh, someone might leave Jefferson and they don't get the education that they need. So we have to try and figure out what can we do now and what can we do now to ensure that teachers who are currently working there, who uh, produced or uh, the Blue Ribbon School, don't get tired of this and end up leaving? So we have to do something to make sure that we improve the working conditions and learning outcomes and learning conditions of the students in the schools now, as opposed to waiting and renovating down the road. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Perella? All set. OK. Uh, this one is uh, for you. Um, a few years ago, we were constantly hearing about the uh, dysfunctional Board of Education. Uh, then a new chairman took over. And then a new superintendent came in, a new chief financial officer, and there seemed to be a sigh of relief. Then things began to implode a little bit uh, with the charge uh, of, of racism on the board, the superintendent tearing down the structure, rebuilding it, and then leaving. Uh, the mass exodus of central office personnel. What does the Board of Education need to do to regain its footing and the trust and respect of the citizens? Uh, I think first and foremost, um, it's supporting our new superintendent. Um, again, the, you know, when you look at the way the board voted, um, he was not given unanimous decision to, to vote him in. Um, as someone, you know, let's say taking a new job, I don't think that's a, a great vote of confidence to begin with. So I think, it, I think first off, we need to support our new superintendent uh, in the decisions he's making, and he's making some pretty good ones so far, I think, in developing the structure of leadership throughout, the, you know, the school system. Um, I think the second thing is in, in rebuilding the confidence with the community is, at least from my perspective as a, you know, potential board member is, you know, reaching out to the community more, being more involved with the community in terms of, uh, you know, I, I view being a board member as almost being an advocate with the community for the school system. So I plan to do kind of, you know, what I've been doing as so far with campaigning is 
going out, talking to parents, talking to teachers, talking to former administrators, really anyone who has an opinion or something to say uh, about the school system, I'm willing to listen to them and take that in as kind of the knowledge base that I use in, in making decisions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Grafter? Would you mind repeating the question? Um, sure. Um, let's see. A few years ago, we were constantly hearing about the dysfunctional Board of Education, then a new chairman took over. Uh, that would be Mr. Lyons. Uh, and then a new superintendent came in, a new chief financial officer, and there was this big sigh of relief. Then things began to implode. Uh, what with the cha charge of racism, uh, the superintendent tearing down the structure, rebuilding it in his own way, and then leaving. And the mass exodus of central office personnel. Uh, what does the Board of Education need to do to regain its footing and the trust and respect of the citizens? Okay. So the first thing is that as a board, you're, you know, you're charged with hiring the superintendent. So then once you hire the superintendent, whether, whether or not it was by a 9 to 0 vote, um, you need to support the superintendent because otherwise what you end up happening is that superintendents will leave and because they don't feel like they have enough control over reorganizing this district the way that they believe that it needs to be reorganized in order to move the district forward. That being said, uh, it's, it's also about the board members uh, respecting each other and interacting with each other and op with open communication and transparency. So if we have that on the board, then it's highly likely that we'll be able to fully support the superintendent because we all have the same goal. The goal is to improve outcomes for students. And it's not always about test scores, it's about helping them become <coughs> good citizens. So once we have that in place, then we, the board can focus on establishing policies and programs to try and move the district further um, and supporting the superintendent in terms of getting the infrastructure in place and the organization of the district in place so that we are able to build capacity. It, for me, in, that, in that way, we'll be able to, to uh, um, support or be the voice of the district as well as, the school, as, well as the, the district A, as well as the, the entire school district. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Perella? Um, I just believe that the new format that the board has moved to with the, uh, the one meeting a month being, you know, what they're calling a, a workshop, I think is, is definitely a, a, a huge step forward in kind of bringing the community in um, to really give them the opportunity to know what's going on, where they're not kind of just coming to a board meeting um, to hear, get a packet, and hear what's going on when the vote is made. So I, I think that's definitely a, a positive step forward as well in, in kind of bringing the community um, back and, and giving them, you know, let's say a better feeling as to what's going on. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Grauker? Yeah, as far as the, the new format, the first month being more of a workshop presentation and sec second month being more of a, a business meeting for the board, I, uh, I like that format. Um, what I envision or see in, that, in terms of that format is that it will have the board members themselves interact more with each other outside of the, those meetings, which then in turn should make the meetings more e effective and more efficient. So for me, the the, exi the, the the business meeting, the second meeting of the month, is more of a, of a meeting where we just go there to vote and discuss things that already were discussed. So we should already know what the situation is in terms of whether or not something will pass or not pass, and we can try and work things through before we get to that point with the meeting. Thank you. Uh, and this is your uh, turn to go first. Uh, this may be... Um, there may be a little redundancy in here, but uh, I think it's important. Uh, the Republican Party uh, Board of Education platform states all Republican board members voted to approve the new superintendent, Dr. Stephen Adamowski, and we pledge our full support to Dr. Adamowski as he moves forward with implementing the strategic plan, building a world-class administration, and instituting positive cultural changes in Norwalk Public Schools. There's been a lot of criticism of members who have voted many times against the superintendent, uh, in this case, in, in that case it was uh, Dr. Rivera, against his agenda and against the majority of, of board members who were supporting that agenda. How important is unanimity and should the loyal opposition, as it were, uh, be criticized for pursuing their agenda if they truly believe that uh, that uh, things may be headed in the wrong direction. Um, is this a situation where the board of, of board members 
should follow their own head and heart, uh, or should they just sort of go along to, to be supportive, as we talked about a, a few moments ago? <clears throat> yeah, as a board member, I would definitely challenge something that I don't believe uh, is uh, going in the right direction for the district. But that challenge would be both based on my personal and professional experiences and, ba and uh, background, as well as what I draw from in terms of uh, District A um, parents and residents, including the rest of the district. So going back to what Mr. Perella had said earlier is about you know making yourself available. So uh, naturally, you need to make yourself available, but at the same time, use that information to guide or help you make decisions. Um, in terms of uh, do you go along with or support, it's, it, to me, it's a little bit of both. You hire the superintendent, whether you know I'm on the board or Mr. Perella's on the board, or we hire a superintendent. Uh, you hire a superintendent, even if you disagree with the person in terms of um, what they believe in or where they're going in that direction, your duty is to challenge that person. So if you believe something is not going in the right direction, you need to challenge that individual to say, why are you going this direction and convince me why this is the, the right way to go. Uh, irri irri uh, irrespective of what the outcome might be for that, you still need to support that individual because that individual is still trying to move the district forward in terms of um, improving outcomes for students, and ensuring that teachers, and administrators, and staff are receiving what they need in order to uh, get things done, so to speak, for the students. Mr. Barella. Um, you know, as a board member, I, I don't believe that you would necessarily be, you know, let's say voting in step with the majority, you know, day in, day out. I think if you feel strongly about something, um, you know, again, you vote with what, what the information is you have in front of you and, and again, how your, your head and your heart tell you. If, you're, if your parents and, and community is telling you, you know, one thing which is against what, let's say, the other board members are, are voting for, um, and you clearly vote no on something, well, then, again, you've, you've clearly kind of stated why you're making that vote. Um, in some cases, the, you know, the current and, if you want to say, past board members, I think when they, when they clearly vote no, um, it's, it's been more of a symbolic no, and there really hasn't been anything to, 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 to back what the decision was. Um, if there's information that wasn't provided or, or, or whatever, the, whatever the situation was, um, they clearly haven't gone back to the community to, to explain what their, let's say, reason for a no was. So again, in the case of, let's say, voting against the board or voting against the decision, um, and at least in my position, I'd be clear where I stand and why I'm making that decision. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Crapper? Um, I just wanted to add, in terms of uh, supporting the superintendent and also challenging the superintendent, in terms of challenges, there are going to be times where I might say no. Uh, but in terms of uh, saying no, it's going to be uh, informed by transparency and collaboration. So when I do say yes or when I do say no, I need to make clear to those outside of the board why I agreed or disagreed with my decision. And I'm sure there are going to be times where what I think is correct may not be what others agree with, but I need to provide the evidence for it or the rationale for why I went that way. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Perella? Again, I, I think it's, you know, with, with voting, I think at, at some point, too, you have to also say, you know, you're going to win some and you're going to lose some. And I think at some point you have to really look at a decision and say, is this something that I'm really going to fall on my sword for? So, again, if the community is really backing uh, where your head is and where your decision making is, um, that's one thing. But I think in some cases, you know, you, um, you're going to do with, you know, you're going to make a decision on based on the information that you have. Thank you. And we've come to the final question. Um, and this is a... Uh, Theoretical, of course. It <laughs> depends on a couple of different things. <laughs> uh, Mike Lyons has been chairman for three years, uh, despite having a solid Democratic majority on the board, which annoyed some people <laughs> in the Democratic <laughs> Party uh, in District A, as a matter of fact. Um, if Mike Lyons wins re-election this year, uh, would you plan to vote for Mr. Lyons for a fourth year? And if he's, if he is not nominated by someone else, would either of you uh, put him into nomination for the for uh, chairman? Hey, you, yeah. uh, absolutely. As a uh, so first off, as as a parent who has you know witnessed kind of the comings and goings of the board over the past you know uh, five to eight years. Um, with a lot of the turmoil with superintendents coming and going, um, 
Mike Lyons has been the sound, you know, board member who has really kept a lot of it together. So I would be all for it. I would support him 100%. Thank you. Doctor? Um, based on my observations and what I've read so far, um, I have no issues in not voting for him to be uh, chairman again if I were to be on the board. But at the same time, if there's someone else on the board who would like to try and become chairman, I would like to take a look at that person's uh, ability to uh, bring everyone together and to see what their vision or direction is. In saying that, what I'm also saying is that we also shouldn't have diversity of thought and leadership. So I do approve of Mr. Lyons' work so far, but at the same time, if we have others on the board that wish to become chairman or think that they can move the district in other ways, we should also consider that person as well. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Perella, response? All set? set. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and uh, this would uh, bring us to the closing statements. And uh, uh, let's see, you opened up, uh, Doctor. And uh, so, Mr. Perella, you go first. Okay. Um, thank everyone for listening and, and listening to our uh, answers. I just like to say that as uh, as a you know born and raised individual from Norwalk who's gone through the Norwalk school system with kids going through the school system now, um, I'm committed to you know doing right by the taxpayers and the parents um, as a board member. You know, thoroughly thinking, doing the research, um, looking at every every angle that I possibly can in a decision decision-making process, um, you know, evaluating the risk associated with it, and really making sure that we are, you know, making sound decisions. Um, and, and also, again, being truly like an advocate for the, the parents, taxpayers, and, and ultimately children of Norwalk. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Grubker. I'd like to close by saying that uh, I don't view the board as being a Democratic member or a Republican member or independent or unaffiliated. To me, the board is individuals who, who want to be on the board to, so, to help students um, in all, all ways, in terms of wraparound services, uh, help them become who they should be, give them opportunities to decide what they want to do with their future, as opposed to having limited opportunities. In saying that, uh, what I'm also saying is that I want to be an advocate uh, for the students, um, I know the types of hardships that I experienced being a, uh, being a student, and uh, through my experiences uh, being an educator, I see things that I can do besides just writing about it in terms of research. I want to uh, get my I guess boots on the ground kind of kind of thing um, to really try to make decisions and use my expertise to help move our school district forward. Because I don't see any reason why NOAA compared to any other school district in the state, or if it were any other school district, why there should be differences among school districts. I think every student, no matter where they live in Connecticut, should have an equal opportunity. And that's my charge, my personal charge, if I were to be on the board. Thank you. That just about wraps things up. I want to thank both candidates for uh, making time on a Sunday morning. Uh, <laughs> to do this. I know that it's been very difficult to get you both in the in the room at the same time. It's unfortunate that it had couldn't be done under the uh, same conditions as uh, everyone else, but uh, uh, that's why we're here, <laughs> to do things a little differently than everybody else <laughs> at Nancy on Norwalk. So uh, again, thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you. yes, <laughs> let's all feel free to applaud and uh, cheer. And, uh, and uh, I want to thank, uh, thank the viewers for paying attention and for, for taking such an, an interest in what's going on in our schools because this is our future. Uh, the schools are important. The school boards are four-year positions. And what whoever is elected uh, does over the next four years uh, is going to have a profound effect on on individual lives and on the city of Norwalk for, for years and, and decades to come. So thank you, gentlemen, for stepping up to the plate. Mm, thank you. Thank you.